Okay. Aloha everyone. Happy 50th Earth Day. So glad to see everyone on here. I'm Marie McKenzie. I teach geography at Leeward Community College and I'm so happy to see everyone on here in this virtual setting. I hope you're all well and healthy. Today we are reminded to focus on the unique environmental challenges of our time. It's important to educate the public about these challenges in order to make smart decisions about our natural resources and to ultimately improve the only planet we call home. So the Geography and Environment and Sustainability Committee has something special in store this hour to celebrate Earth Day in this unique virtual setting. It is my great honor and privilege to introduce my mentor and friend, Dr. James Juvik, as our guest speaker today. Dr. Juvik is a retired professor of geography and environmental studies at the University of Hawaii at Hilo. He's had over 30 years of research experience, specializing- Actually, in 50, actually 50 years. 50 years, <laughs> 30 plus years of tropical forest, climate, hydrology, and ecology. He's an internationally well-known expert on conservation management of endangered land tortoises around the world and has many publications on tortoise ecology and conservation. Fun fact, he's worked with the producers of the viral true crime docuseries, Tiger King. He can tell you all about that if we have some time later. And he's worked with people close to my favorite actor and environmentalist, Leonardo DiCaprio. This man has the ability to capture your attention for hours and it's mesmerizing. Let me tell you, he has some awesome stories to share. So if this goes past 1 p.m., feel free to leave or stay. Please save your questions until the end of the presentation. Dr. Juvik himself will be asking us questions during the presentation, so feel free to answer. But if you are not using your microphone, please mute it so that we can hear Dr. Juvik without any distractions. Trust me, you don't want to miss a thing. So without further ado, please give a warm virtual welcome to Dr. Juvik. All right, Dr. Juvik. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you, Marie. Um, just to fill in everyone, um, Ms. McKenzie was one of my students, our student at UH Hilo back in uh, 20, 30 years ago, no, about eight years ago, uh, and uh, graduated from UH Hilo, then went on to Manoa where she got a master's degree. And I don't know why she asked me to give this talk because she knows more about the climate of Hawaii than I do. She just published a very definitive scientific paper on climate change in Hawaii. And plus she's native Hawaiian, so she has all the traditional cultural information as well but I'll just wing it and see what I can get away with, okay? Okay, I'm gonna to switch to my... Um... Okay, um, can everybody hear me? Hopefully. Um, I just threw this joke on. Does everybody get this joke? Juno is in Alaska, obviously, okay? So we know climate is changing uh, all over the world, certainly here in Hawaii as well. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But just to give you an idea of how uh, in another 80 years, if you're living in Michigan, you'll think you're living in uh, Missouri 50 years from now, because it'll be warmer. If you're living in, in Chicago, you'll feel like you're living down in Texas because of the climate change. Just an example of the direct effect of climate change on human activity. I wanna talk about more or less global warming impact on biodiversity, but with one caveat. Um, th there's no doubt the planet is warming up, even though there's people who are climate change deniers. The climate's been changing all the time for hundreds of thousands of years. Probably most of that time not impacted by human activities, but certainly impacted by human activities now. So it's not a question of is climate changing or is warming taking place. It's a question of who's contributing to this warming. Is it just purely natural or is it human mediate, mediated? Okay, and then what is that having to do with biodiversity? So as I said, uh, Ms. McKenzie, your instructor, is an expert on this. This is a paper she published last year in a major uh, climate journal on temperature change in Hawaii over the last century. This is just some of her data showing the warming effect of climate from the 100 years from about 1916 to, 19, uh, to 2016. The red lines indicate cha uh, change during shorter periods, but the entire period, the climate has been warming up significantly. 
uh, and that has implications for all kinds of things, human activity, biodiversity, and so forth. Uh, so I'll be touching on this when I get to the Hawaii section. We know that climate is changing. Uh, this is the world plot for the last thousand years, not the last hundred years of climate change and showing in red climate change, temperature change for the whole world, and in blue, the carbon dioxide content of the atmosphere. Um, so, uh, and particularly since about 1800, you can see there's a pretty good correlation between temperature rise and rise in carbon dioxide. We'll talk more about that uh, shortly. So the climate is changing. So how much of that blue line is contributed by human activity? That's the debate going on in the world right now. Not that the climate is changing, everybody agrees it's changing, but why is it changing and can we do anything about it, okay? If you look at the top graph here, you'll see the blue line, which is sea level. Sea level for the past uh, uh, half million years or uh, no, 500,000 years. Um, yeah, uh, so on the left at zero, that's current date, sea level is where it is, that, that light line going across the diagram. Then just 10,000 years ago, sea level was 120 meters, almost 300 feet lower. Molokai was connected to Maui and Maui was connected to Kohoalawe. Uh, the islands had different shapes because of lower sea level. Sometimes in the past, sea level has been higher than it is right now. Why does sea level change? Sea level change because of global warming and cooling. Well, why does that change sea level? Because that moves ice around. Right now, you can see Greenland uh, in this picture, plus the ice floating on the Arctic Ocean in 1979 and 2003. And you'll notice in 2003, a lot of the ice has melted. If I showed you a picture from last year, would it be even less ice? Uh, and if that ice melts, it may build up sea level. The floating ice on the Arctic Ocean doesn't change sea level too much, but look at Greenland. Greenland has ice a mile thick. If Greenland melted, all melted, if Greenland all melted, the oceans would rise 20 feet, more than 20 feet, which would put Waikiki under the water, underwater, Leeward Community College underwater, and many of the coastal cities of the world underwater. Okay, so we can see a series of ups and downs of sea level over the last half million years, largely caused by glacial episodes and interglacial periods of warming, cooling and warming. Most of those, except for the most recent few centuries, probably had nothing to do with humans and was a natural occurrence of climate change that occurs periodically, okay? Why does climate change in the absence of human activity? There's a couple of forces, I'm not gonna to spend too much time. A famous guy named Milankovic in the 1920s and 30s, a Serbian, figured out that the Earth's orbit around the sun changes in its shape, as shown in the top diagram on the right. The Earth's axis fluctuates, modulates. Normally, we're right now we're tilted about 23 and a half degrees from vertical, the Earth's poles, and that change in axis affects seasonality. Also, there are times during the, during the Earth's orbit when we're closer to the sun and further from the sun. Progression of the equinoxes at the bottom. All of those things occur in different cycles. Notice eccentricity, a 100,000 year cycle. Obliquity of the orbit, a 41,000 year cycle. And progression of the equinoxes, somewhere around a 20,000 year cycle. So, the Earth's orbit is shifting, the distance of the Earth to the sun is shifting, the tilt of the Earth is shifting, that affects the amount of sunlight received at different latitudes and encourages uh, stronger or weaker seasonality and the formation of glaciers at high latitude or the melting of those glaciers at high latitude. If we look at these cycles, eccentricity, tilt, progression, over these half a million or 800,000 years, you can see they're cycling in different sequences, but if you take the combined signal, which is the fourth red line, that's the net effect of on solar radiation received, increasing or decreasing solar radiation. Decreasing radiation, more glaciers. Increasing radiation, more melting. More recently, you'll see the last blue line, that's an oxygen isotope ratio from the bottom of the ocean that shows when it's 
the ocean the ocean cores down there and the amount of oxygen in these cores changes because of various radioactive isotopes that behave differently at different temperatures. But that pattern reinforces Milankovitch's curves and makes it more uh, acceptable. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on the 16-18 ratio, except that ocean cores can tell us about the temperature of the ocean in the past, and that correlates with the uh, distance and uh, relationship between the Earth and the Sun. So during sea level rise, which were, is going on right now because the glaciers are melting very rapidly, we're worried about rising sea level. Even the city of Honolulu has a plan to deal with rising sea level. Why? Because most of the valuable tourist assets of the Hawaiian Islands are at or near sea level. This is just an example of one case uh, in Bangladesh uh, next to India. Most of it is a low-lying estuary and a low-lying delta of a major river. And if you raise the sea level only about four feet, four and a half feet, you can see 22,000 square kilometers or 16% of the country is inundated and 15% of the population, 17 million people are gonna have to evacuate or move or do something. So we can see, this is just one example. This happens all over the world, obviously. So changing sea level, uh, and that would also, of course, affect the biodiversity of those areas and obviously the human populations. This is just a map based on reconstruction from cores in the ground that show different kinds of pollen in different areas at different times. 18,000 years ago, you can see ice was all over Canada. Canada was under ice, okay? No Canada, just ice. And even the United States was covered by partially by ice 18,000 years ago. And the associated ecosystems, notice temperate grassland, uh, semi-desert, dry tundra, all these different vegetation types, ecosystems. And all of those had lots of plants and animals living in them. They moved down into the United States from Canada, many of them. And then today, the current situation on the right, we can see these vegetation areas have expanded. And imagine each one of those ecosystems has many different kinds of plants and animals associated with it. And uh, all of these things are gonna change dramatically. This had nothing to do with humans. This had to do with the ice ages, the natural ice ages. But what happened between 18,000 years ago and the current situation is that human beings moved into the new world from Asia. And they started impacting the ecosystem in many ways, some ways different from the climate impact changes. They started killing some of the big delicious animals like uh, the mammoths and so on. And they started fires, they started developing agriculture and did all kinds of things, adapting to the climates of those areas. And as the climates changed, the people adapted, moved around and added their own efforts at change in the landscape. Change that was already taking place because of climate change. So in each of those ecosystems, there were complex food webs of different plants and animals and so on and so forth. And they were changing because of climate change, moving north or south or modifying, becoming new species if they got isolated. And you add humans to this and it makes it even more complicated. We gotta put humans in this, in this uh, uh, biodiversity uh, system starting in the new world about 10 to 12,000 years ago. They may have killed more deer, but not squirrels. And so they may have uh, fought with mountain lions or they may have done things that changed this food web. Obviously the humans are trying to change it in their favor, encourage plants they liked, encourage animals they like, discourage things that attack them, so on. So humans are now changing things just as the climate itself is changing. For example, during the ice age, much of the lower California, the desert of the Southwest was much wetter. There were big lakes. And in those lakes were native fish. Then it dried out as the glaciers moved north, it dried out. And today some of those fish are only found in little red dots there in little isolated oases where there are little water systems, not big lakes. And they became unique species. And they're protected, well, they occur there. But now they're, now they're in trouble not because the glaciers are melting so much, they have these little isolated uh, ponds and lakes, but human beings are there doing agriculture. They're pumping the water table. And many of these 
uh, little isolated water bodies are disappearing and with them the extinction of these little fish. Now they're not the fish you say well that's not a big deal a small fish but just an example of how climate associated changes ended up uh, sorted out where they were and also um, how humans are now interacting with this situation. Here's another example. This is a wood frog. These frogs love cold. They like to be near the glaciers, but not at the glaciers. And uh, as the glaciers retreated, the wood frogs moved up into Canada. Now they're mostly found in Canada, but they're found in a few little isolated places like in Oklahoma and Kansas and little, you know, I don't know, wet areas or little mountain areas uh, where they still survive. And maybe they've changed into new species, but these are relics. They should have moved north, but they were too lazy and they stayed where they were. And somehow they've survived, but you can appreciate now humans are also changing these landscapes. So climate change and human change, change are rapidly affecting biodiversity. One of my favorite creatures is the musk oxen. Okay, interesting. Just going back for a moment. You see on this original diagram, even when the glaciers were there 18,000 years ago, there was a little ice-free area up in northern near Greenland. See that little area? The musk oxen hung out in that area during the glacial period, but there were also musk oxen down in the United States, which is now the United States. But then after the humans came in, they killed off the musk oxen near uh, the southern margin of the glaciers. But the little group of musk oxen up north, they survived for thousands of years unbothered. But then Aleuts, Alaskans, native people moved into that area, but they didn't kill off all the musk oxen. They've hunted them, but there's still musk oxen there. The problem with musk oxen, they developed a, a situation, def their defense against their main threat, wolves, was to form a circle with the males aimed outward and the females and the babies in the middle. And they would hold their ground and fight off the, the uh, wolves and bears and so on that way. Well, that worked. But then when humans showed up, they would just come nearby. And, and when it was Native Americans, they could maybe shoot them with a bow and arrow. And if they killed one, it would just fall down and the other ones would form a tighter circle. And then when guys showed up with guns, they could shoot every one of them and they just keep forming a circle until there was one left. So uh, they were all wiped out in the mainland United States, uh, of what are now the United States, but they've survived in, in Canada. And they were all wiped out in Asia because there was no safe area during the glacial period and the human beings took care of the musk oxen. But we still have them, thank, thankfully, up in Canada and Alaska. Uh, one of my favorites, another one, Wrangell Island. This is a little island off of um, Russia and would have been connected to Russia at different sea level stands, one lower sea level, but then it formed an island, a barren Arctic island. But on that island, there were mammoths, but it was a little island, so the mammoths became a different species, a dwarf mammoth. The big mammoths were wiped out by uh, paleo hunters in the US and Asia. Uh, thousands and thousands of years ago, but the little dwarf mammoth survived until about 3,000 years ago on this offshore island until some of the uh, native peoples of Russia with sailing skills, or not sailing skills, they could uh, um, pirate, uh, pilot small boats and uh, kayaks to the island, and then they killed off the small one, but only about 3,500 years ago. So it survived almost to the present. Why do I have a picture of Alicia Keys there? Because she's about the same height as one of those dwarf mammoths, so you can get some idea of scale, okay? So climate change, human activity, all mixing together, making a complicated story, okay? Now, Ms. McKenzie said, don't talk about tortoises too much. You love tortoises. You're always giving lectures about tortoises, using them as examples of this or that. Well, I can't help talking about tortoises, at least for a couple minutes. Uh, and some of you may be community college students. I started out at a community college I have to say against my will. Actually, when I graduated from high school, I was a lousy student uh, and I just didn't want to go back to college. I didn't want to go to college. In fact, I ran away and joined a circus. And I only joined the circus because the guy that owned the circus said, I'll give you this giant tortoise if you work for the circus for free for all summer, which I thought was a great idea. Um, my mother thought it was a stupid idea. Uh, but anyway, later she came and took me away from the circus and made me go to community college. That's my tortoise calling here. I'll let you meet him later. Um, anyway, um, hold on, be quiet for a while.
Okay, so anyway, um, tortoises are very interesting. Um, a part of biodiversity, most people think about saving biodiversity, think about rhinos, elephants, lions, things that are beautiful or important animals like fish we eat or animals we need. Um, but I, I care about tortoises. So this is an island in the Indian Ocean called Aldabra. It's only a few feet above sea level. It's one of the last places in the world with giant tortoises. Where else do we have giant tortoises? The Galapagos Islands. But there were giant tortoises everywhere tens of thousands of years ago, not in the cold areas, but in the subtropics and tropical areas. If sea level rises a few feet, this island could disappear and the giant tortoises would go extinct. So I'm interested in climate change and the conservation of this particular tortoise. Now it's interesting, this island went underwater several times. Remember I showed you the slide that showed sea level was higher and lower? Several times this island went under, under the ocean and the tortoises disappeared. But this island is near Madagascar and new tortoises drifted out there. They don't really swim, but they floated out there and reestablished themselves after every inundation. So you might say, well, stop worrying. If it goes underwater, it'll come back again and the tortoises will float there from Madagascar. No, because people got to Madagascar about 1,000, 1,500 years ago, and they killed all the giant tortoises. So there are no giant tortoises left to repopulate this uninhabited island if it disappears under the water and comes back again. So we gotta worry about these tortoises. That's the Galapagos Islands. They still have giant tortoises. That's Aldabra, where, um, where I'm just showing the picture of. These two tortoise groups still survive, but there's lots of other tortoises in the world. They're just not big tortoises. Most of them are not very big, but they're all important and they're all have important roles in the ecosystem. And they're all very much subject to climate change, either because of sea level change or because tortoises are cold blooded animals. And so therefore, if it gets too hot or too cold, they can't deal with it. They're not like humans. They're not warm blooded animals, they're reptiles, okay? Now, just a few thousand years ago, there were lots more tortoises in the world. Look at the Caribbean. There were many species of tortoises in the Caribbean. Land, I'm talking land turtles now, not hanu, not water turtles, sea turtles, land turtles. All of these red tortoises largely exterminated by humans. In some cases, paleo humans that were evolving over thousands of years. In some cases, more recently. You'll see in the Indian Ocean, a bunch of extinct red dots. Those Indian Ocean Islands were only, there, there were islands actually discovered by Europeans. Europeans like to say they found the Hawaii and Captain Cook came here. Well, obviously the Hawaiians were here for a thousand years before Captain Cook. Um, so in the Indian Ocean, the Portuguese sailed to some of these islands in the 1500s and they, there was no people there and never had been. And so they killed all the tortoises <laughs> because they're delicious and they're easy to kill. Uh, even Australia had some weird horned tortoises and even islands in the Pacific like Fiji and New Caledonia had giant tortoises. They were all killed off by early colonizers of the islands because their shells protected them for 50 million years. Tortoises are some of the oldest creatures. Tortoises were here before the dinosaurs and after the dinosaurs. And they developed a way to survive with their big thick shells. But when human beings showed up, they said, that's not a shell. That's a cooking pot. Start a fire, roll the tortoise over in the fire well, with tortoise soup. So human beings and tor giant tortoises uh, didn't get along very well and the humans won largely. So I've been studying tortoises in the desert because have you heard the concept of a canary in a coal mine? Why would you take a canary into a coal mine? Probably they don't like to be in the dark. Well, it's because they're very sensitive and they're very small. So if there's poisonous gas in a, in a uh, mine, they might smell it first and fall off their perch before the human gets sick. So if you see your canary fall off its perch in its little cage, you better get out of the mine. Well, tortoises are like that for climate change. These are desert tortoises that live in California and Mexico and various places. They live in burrows. When do they come out? They can't come out when it's too cold because they're cold blooded. If they come out when it's too hot, they get uh, killed by the heat. They got to come out in the morning, look around for some food, get back, maybe try to find a mate. They spend 90% of their time in the burrow because the whole place is generally not very nice place for cold-blooded animals. So what if you change the temperature, you make it hotter or colder? 
It affects the behavior of the tortoises. So we've been studying what kind of temperatures they can tolerate and how temperature change might impact uh, their survival. So here we have temperature sensors in the burrows, on the burrows, on the tortoises, trying to figure out how they're adapting to change. Now, climates have changed and the tortoises have changed. They've moved north and south. Remember that picture I showed of where the ecosystems were? They can move uh, if things change or their population on one end of the range does better and the other end of the range does worse. They can move around slowly. But what's happening recently is climate is changing too fast too fast for most of these animals to adapt. They will adapt, but the rate of change now, a degree per century or so, that's super fast change compared to the climate changes that took place under natural conditions in the past. Why is it changing so fast? Because of human mediated climate change we'll talk about in just a minute. Now, I just wanna sh show that, that how complicated this is. This little tortoise lives in South Africa near Cape Town. It's one of the world's most endangered tortoises. There's only about a thousand in the wild and they're in little isolated patches. And I'm working on this tortoise right now on conservation. We've created a nature reserve down in South Africa. But this tortoise only lives in a certain shrubland near Cape Town. It's called the Fembo shrubland. And you say, okay, it looks like it covers a pretty big area. These tortoises should be okay. Well, this is where the eco region of Fenbos is, but the actual Fenbos is almost all gone because Cape of South Africa is just like Northern California. It's full of grapes. People plant grapes and wine and so on, wine grapes. So most of the tortoises habitat has been destroyed. Now the climate is changing there and it's changing. You can see that rainfall, of course, it looks like it's in the summer, it's actually in the winter because this is in the Southern Hemisphere, you see the red line is the temperature. The temperature is getting warmer and the rainfall is decreasing. So climate change is infecting these tortoises. But probably more than climate change is just the fact that most of the habitat has been destroyed by human activity, now all in grapes. So we can't just say climate change is causing something. We have to look at all the interac interacting factors, okay? When you have decreasing rainfall and warmer temperatures, you get more fires. This is our nature reserve. It looks kind of ugly. You can see uh, irrigated grapes in the background on the left and top. This area in gray is actually a shrubland. And this is a fire that occurred in our reserve because it's right in the middle of a highway it goes right through our nature reserve. You might say, that's a pretty dumb idea. Why don't you find a better place for a reserve? Well, this is where the tortoises are. So this is where we made the reserve. And fires increasingly, so ah, climate change causing fire. No, people are causing fire. Cars catch on fire, tires fall off cars, accidents. So climate change is making fire more uh, successful, but humans are increasing the rate of fire from a natural background rate. These areas did burn naturally, but now it's being in, uh, influenced by human activity with climate change. So complicating management. After a fire, we look around, we find dead tortoises because these tortoises don't dig burrows, these little guys that I showed you. They just live on the surface. And if they're there and a big fire comes through fast, they burn up, okay? Now, what can we do? We've actually built some uh, artificial burrows, hoping they go in there once in a while. But humans have done something else in this area that's adversely affected the tortoises. There used to be aardvarks here. And I know if you're in, uh, uh, Miss McKenzie's class, she always talks about this silly dog she has. It actually looks like an aardvark. It's not very attractive. No, no, that's not true. Anyway, aardvarks live in this area where we have our nature reserve, but they're not, in, they're not there anymore because humans killed them all. Why would you kill a silly looking thing like this? Because these aardvarks dig giant burrows under the roads, in the irrigation ditches, all over the place. So they got rid of these guys. Um, and so now there aren't any big burrows where these tortoises could hide. So when the fire comes through, they burn up. Climate change, yes, but human, other human activities that you might not think the, the uh, aardvark should have anything to do with the tortoises, but they did. And so we have to factor that into management of this reserve in an aardvark free and climate changing and human active situation, it's difficult, okay? Something else shows up here after you convert it to agriculture, even if we have some piece of natural terrain. 
crows. There are native crows down there. The native crows there probably always ate little tortoises, but now there's millions more of these crows because they love agricultural landscape. There's more food, more water, more things to do, more dead animals on the roadway. They can have roadkill. So there's more, more predators. So I have cameras set up watching. That's not a real tortoise, that's a decoy tortoise. I made plastic decoys, 3D printed, just to see what the birds would do to them. And uh, they try to eat them. And fortunately they can't eat this tortoise, but I was just checking to see how we could, we were thinking of ways to, I wanted to kill the crows, but they said, no, you can't do that. So now we're taking crows, we're taking decoys and filling them full of poison. Not poison to kill the bird, because if you kill it, just another bird will show up. To train the birds, we're putting in things that make the birds vomit. So they take a bite of this little tortoise and they vomit. So I'll say, okay, I'm not gonna eat that again. And hopefully they learn. But that's it. That's during the day. At night, we have to put hot pepper in these guys because the mongoose and the other foxes and stuff, the, the mammals will show up. They don't like hot pepper. So we're trying to train the animals to avoid the tortoises without killing anybody. That's a work in progress. I, I went to a farmer who had a one crow nest on his property on an old windmill, and he just started collecting the tortoise shells when the bird laid eggs and the eggs hatched. In two years, he collected all these tortoise shells under one nest that fledged four birds one year and four birds the next. So the crows are a problem for the tortoises. Okay, now, I'll, I'll be off tortoises in a minute because I know uh, uh, that uh, our uh, leader, um, Ms. McKenzie, is probably rolling her eyes and said, I thought you were talking about climate change. Okay, one last example. Here's Mauritius in the Indian Ocean. It used to have giant tortoises. It's had climate change, but humans only arrived there a few hundred years ago. They converted all, they killed all the tortoises, changed everything to sugar and, uh, and tea growing. And, but they left one little island here, Ila Jaret, the egret island. They didn't bother that, but they noticed there was a rare plant growing on the island and a beautiful ebony wood. But they noticed over a couple centuries that the ebony woods were dying and there were no young ones coming up. Then they had an idea. They put giant tortoises from somewhere else, from Aldabra, that island I showed you. They got some giant tortoise. Here's one uh, uh, eating a uh, lahala seed, hala seed. They put these tortoises on the island and they noticed the tortoises were eating the seeds of the ebony trees. And then of course they were pooping out the seeds of the ebony trees after they, their gut system had mangled them up a bit. And it turned out these seeds going through a tortoise germinated very easily where there hadn't been anything germinating there for a couple hundred years because the tortoises were gone. And they noticed that if a, if a seed passed through a tortoise, many more germinated, 30% germinated after 60, 70 days, whereas only half a 10% germinated if they just laid on the ground or not at all, or they're eaten by other insects. So the tortoise, here's the island from, a, from a, above. The light green are new trees that have come up just in the last decade or so, because there hadn't been any new trees for a couple of hundred years. So the tortoise is helping that particular species, okay? Now, that leads me to the next item. Um, can, can you people see me? Yes, we can see you. Okay, great. Okay, I'm gonna show you another tortoise right now. This is my tortoise. His name is Ammo. I call him Ammo because he's from the Amazon. And he's a pretty big tortoise. And I wanna just show you Ammo. This is Ammo, can you see him? Yes, we can. Okay, he's a beautiful, he's called a red-footed tortoise. <laughs> red -footed. Now, when you think of the Amazon, what kind of animals do you think of? Jaguars, uh, tapirs, monkeys, parrots, all kinds of stuff live in that beautiful tropical rainforest. But who does the hard work in the rainforest? Ammo. Why? Because you've got to distribute tree seeds around. The trees drop seeds, they have big fruit. They drop the fruit right underneath the tree. They don't want it to germinate there. They want it to germinate some distance away. 
And the monkeys go in the trees. The monkeys are, um, um, monkeys basically have diarrhea all the time. They just eat all this stuff and they crap about three minutes later, okay? So if they eat fruit under a tree, they crap under the tree. The parrots may eat fruit, but they'll chew it all up with their beaks. It's the tortoises. They eat big fruit and they're slow moving, but they have slow digestive systems because of um, their um, cold blooded. They can go for a mile or two, takes eight days to digest their meal and they can poop their seeds miles away from the tree. That's a good thing, okay? So these tortoises are important components of that ecosystem. But again, right now, uh, they're mainly threatened, not by climate change there, but by people collecting them. And, and uh, this one was, I showed you, was confiscated from a local hotel. But uh, they collect them and sell them for pets or food. So uh, that's one important source of ecosystem uh, integrity in the Amazon that's being reduced by taking all these tortoises out of the, out of the system, okay? That's ammo, I'm sorry, I put him away. You're not seeing him again. He's very sloppy. Um, Okay, now that's the end of turtles and tortoises. Forget about them, okay? Uh, because we don't have any turtles and tortoises in Hawaii except a few pet tur turtles. Of course, we have sea turtles. Let's talk a little bit about climate change in Hawaii and um, the implications for biodiversity here in the Hawaiian Islands, okay? There are three major controls of climate in Hawaii. The prevailing trade winds, I'll explain that in a minute, ocean effects that moderate the uh, extremes of climate here, and mountain effects, okay? And all those working together produce an incredible diversity of climate zones and changes if the climate changes, changes to the conditions on the islands, and those changes may affect the biodiversity, irrespective of human activity. And of course, human activity is also overwhelming. Down at South Point on the Big Island, you can see a tree that's bent over like this. It's shaped by the wind. The wind is always blowing there from the east to the west. That's the trade winds. And the trees grow completely distorted, okay? Because the winds are so strong there. It's very close to the ocean, all right? Trade winds. Why are they called trade winds? Anybody know? I'll tell you. Okay. See where it says Northeast Trades? That's where the Hawaiian Islands are sitting, north of the equator. And the tr winds are coming from the north and the east. Um, and uh, your instructor will lecture you on Coriolis force and all the other factors that cause the winds to be from that direction. But the point is, generally speaking, the winds come from the Northeast, the trade winds. And so when they hit an island, they rise on the windward side facing the winds. They rise cool and it rains. Then they go over the mountain, come down the other side, they warm up, dry out, and it doesn't rain. So we have a windward and a leeward side with very, very different climates, okay? And very different uses by humans. Where do you put the tourists? On the leeward side, okay? Because they want to be at the beaches with the sun out, okay? Um, where do you grow better kalo? Maybe on the windward side where there's more water. Um, so we'll talk about that in just a moment. But I want you also to look at the fact that where those uh, pink dots are above Northeast Trades on the, on the margin, the air rises at the equator because hot air rises, goes north toward the pole, then sinks down into a high pressure just north of us. And where it sinks down, the air is warming up, okay? So if we look at Oahu, Oahu, uh, where are the clouds? They're on the windward side, at least in this satellite image. What's the highest elevation on Oahu? Anybody know? Mount Ka'ala, 4,000 feet. We laugh at that on the Big Island. We've got 13,000 feet on the Big Island, okay? But you'll see clouds forming on the windward side because the air is rising from the northeast over the Ko'olaus and precipitating fog and rain and moisture, okay? But if you look at the vertical structure of the atmosphere, remember I said the air is sinking up high? We have something called a temperature inversion. Uh, the, the bigger graph, you'll see the black squares. 
I made the students get up at 4.30 in the morning and drive up Mauna Kea all the way to the top, 13,000 feet, starting at 4.30. And we hung thermometers out the window and measured the temperature. And you can see the temperature dropping as we drove up the mountain. Um, we did it at night because in the daytime, the temperature would be changing just because of sun angle. But at night, it's stable. And by the time we got up to about 6,000 feet, the temperature was down to five degrees centigrade uh, in the low, in the 40s uh, Fahrenheit. And the students were all saying, turn around, go back, we're gonna freeze. But then we went up higher and it got warmer. That's because that's where that sinking air, sinking air is compressed and warming up. That's called a temperature inversion, an inversion, a reversal of the normal condition. And what that means, if clouds ride up on the mountain, they get stuck under that inversion, okay? So on the big island, you can see clouds on the windward side and you can see people up on top of Mauna Kea there um, looking down at the top of the clouds. Why is the clouds have a top? Because there's an inversion there to keep it from going up further up the mountain. One of the reasons so many people wanna build telescopes on top of Mauna Kea is that typically the top of the mountain is out of the clouds, it's above the clouds, okay? We'll get back to that in just a moment. But this inversion also affects the climate. And if the climate is changing, if it's getting warmer or cooler, if the ocean is warming up, if the atmosphere is warming up or cooling, it may change where this inversion occurs on the mountainside. And that will affect the vegetation, the ecosystems, and the plant and species living below it and above it. Above it, it's dry. Below it, it's wet, generally speaking. I took this picture one day years ago when uh, we had volcanic activity at Kilauea producing a lot of uh, volcanic uh, vog. Uh, and that's Hualalai, uh, the volcano Hualalai over Kona. And that's not, you can see clouds above the volcano, but then there's this sort of mist or gray or looks like fog. That's actually just clear air with dust and vog pollution in it. And you can see a very straight line because that's where the temperature starts increasing and that cloud can't rise above it. So you can see here, if it was raining, it'd be raining underneath that cloud and it would be dry above on the summit of Hualalai. So you understand an inversion. And the height of that inversion can change from, um, can change um, if with climates changing, okay? And that will affect what kind of plants and animals can live in that area, okay? Now, now I wanna talk about the really important observatory. Everybody's talking about the 30 meter telescope, the telescopes on Mauna Kea. There's debate, there's argument, there's sacred aspects, there's scientific aspects. But for my money, those, those telescopes are not the important observatories on this island. You're looking at Mauna Loa. And if you could look very closely near the summit, there's a little white area, almost invisible, that uh, is Mauna Loa. Observatory. We don't hear too much about Mauna Loa Observatory, we hear about Mauna Kea Observatories. But high on Mauna Loa, there's this little collection of buildings, doesn't look like much. They're building billion dollar stuff on Mauna Kea. These are just hundred thousand dollar little buildings, doesn't look like much. But this is the most important observatory in Hawaii and possibly the most important observatory in the world because it's measuring the background conditions of climate for the whole planet. How can it do that up on top of Mauna Loa? I'll explain. Also point out one other thing that we like about this observatory. Because it's on an active volcano, they built a little barrier above the, above the uh, observatory to deflect lava if it comes down from above. A lot of, uh, a lot of uh, volcanic eruptions on our island occur at much lower elevations. Not all of them occur in the summit area. And as a consequence, um, they've been there for 50, 60 years and they haven't got inundated by lava because Mauna Loa hasn't erupted very much in the last 50 or 60 years. But we like it for one reason. If a lava flow emits from the volcano at the summit and comes down and hits that barrier and then it gets deflected because they're gonna come down towards Hilo, that's where I live. It's gonna be deflected a little bit and then it's gonna come down to Hilo. And if it comes to my house or my neighbor's house or it goes over the school or wipes out a service station or a restaurant or something, we can say, it's the government's fault. They built that barrier. Now it came into my house. If they hadn't built that barrier to gone somewhere else, I'm gonna sue you guys. But now normally you would just say, Madame Pele goes wherever she wants. That's 
uh, an act of God or an act of Madame Pele, we can't sue anybody. But maybe we could sue the government because they diverted the lava flow. I don't know. Nobody's tried it, but they haven't needed to yet. Anyway, forget about that. This is Mauna Loa Observatory. It's a weather station run by NOAA, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. Doesn't look like much. When you look across to Mauna Kea, there's giant telescopes up there measuring what's going on in outer space and billions of miles away. Why is this place more important? This is measuring what's going on on our planet. This is the only one we have right now. People are talking about going to the moon or Mars or whatever. I don't think so. Um, this is where we live. And this is measuring the heartbeat and the behavior of this whole island, of this whole uh, Earth planet. You say, well, how can I do that? It's out in the middle of Hawaii. Well, who cares? Well, because this is one of the cleanest places in the world. We're in the middle of the biggest ocean on top of a mountain above an inversion. We have some of the cleanest air in the world, except of course, of the volcanoes erupting above it, but that hasn't happened lately. So measuring what's going on in the atmosphere at Mauna Loa is considered to be the classic background character of the atmosphere for the whole planet, makes it super important. Most of you have textbooks on climate or weather or geography. You see this curve. This is carbon dioxide concentration of the atmosphere. Um, over the last 50, 60, 70 years, okay? The little ups and downs are the fact that carbon dioxide up, up there changes a little bit from season to season because there are plants lower on the mountain and plants take up and give off carbon dioxide differentially at different seasons. But anyway, the trend is, I don't know, you'd say, well, okay, that's interesting. I wonder what's so important. Well, about in the 1960s, the numbers were about 310, 320 parts per million of carbon dioxide. By 2015 and 2016 and now, it's over 400 parts per million. Okay, that's an increase of 20 or 30 percent, which is that important? I don't know. What kind of a gas is carbon dioxide? It's a greenhouse gas. What does that mean? It means sunlight goes through carbon dioxide. It's transparent, but then it's converted to heat on the Earth's surface. It's absorbed by the Earth. The Earth gives off long wave radiation. That's called heat radiation, infrared. That can't get out through the carbon dioxide. It gets absorbed by the carbon dioxide and sent back to Earth. So carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. So is methane. So are some other gases that are uh, causing the Earth's temperature to increase. Remember the first diagram I showed you was the relationship between temperature and carbon dioxide. But now still you might say, well, you sound excited about this curve, but I, I just can't get excited. I decided I wasn't that excited either until I thought of something. What if I put a picture of me when I was on top of Mauna Kea? Well, in 1966, I was up on top of Mauna Kea, not with this alligator. That was Costa Rica, but same year. Then I was up there just recently. I said, yeah, Juvik, you've really changed in 50 or 60 years. Now I get an idea of the effect of change, okay? So put yourself on top of Mauna Kea this year, go visit it, and then go visit again 50, 60 years later and see what you think, okay? So dramatic change. What's causing that change? Recently, even though there are climate change deniers and global warming deniers and so on and so forth, I won't mention anyone specifically, but basically in the last century or so, we've started using oil, coal, last two centuries, dramatic increases in the release of carbon dioxide. I want you to look at the um, line and sort of in the middle where it says USA. We were the top guys uh, until fairly recently as an ind independent country, but we've trailed off a little bit and actually de declined in our use of carbon dioxide, in our emission of carbon dioxide, because why? Because we've changed to some uh, non-fossil fuels like wind and solar, but mainly we've switched to natural gas, which releases less carbon dioxide. Um, but what's happened? China, by 2005, China has taken off. Now they're the biggest single polluter, okay? Because they got over a billion people. We only have 300 million. And look at India down there. It's kind of low, but it's coming up. They got a billion people. And why are they increasing so fast? Because they want all the same stuff we have, automobiles, drive-in restaurants, uh, whatever, okay? Europe and the USA are starting to plateau and actually decrease a little. And the black line is all the rest of the world. That's India, Europe, US, and China is only a few countries. All the rest of the world want good stuff too. And so they wanna burn oil, make factories, so on. And we can see massive amounts of carbon dioxide. That explains, 
that curve, right? So climates change naturally, yes. We might be warming up even if we weren't putting any uh, carbon dioxide into the atmosphere just because of these cycles that I talked about over tens of thousands of years caused by Earth-Sun relationships. But the rate at which climate is changing now is dramatically increased because of human activity, which also means that plants and animals that might be able to adapt to change, they produce a lot of offspring and a few of those can tolerate higher temperatures. They survive, the other ones die, survival of the fittest. But when change is so exceptionally fast, many plants and animals don't have time generationally and evolutionarily to adapt. And so they go extinct, okay? Here's a current temperatures of the Big Island, just rough colors from sea level, which is about 24 degrees centigrade right now in the high 70s, to Mauna Loa, Mauna Kea summit areas, three degrees centigrade, sort of in the high 30s, around 40 degrees. Um, that's the current temperature regime affected by what? Altitude. So our mountains are a very important factor. As you go up in altitude, temperature drops because the air is thinner, doesn't hold heat. So all of those areas have ecosystems that are adapted to those different temperature conditions, rainfall conditions, evaporation conditions. Okay, that's today. Let's go forward 100 years. Back to now, 100 years. The upper parts of the mountain, you don't see as much white anymore. There's not much alpine. Temperatures are warmed up. Six degrees warmer on top of the mountain or six degrees as opposed to three degrees. Three degrees centigrade, that's six or seven degrees Fahrenheit. Temperature change in less than 100 years. That's dramatic change. Plants and animals have trouble adapting to those kind of changes, okay? Top of Mauna Kea, Lake Waiau, near the summit of Mauna Kea. The Hawaiians had an ads quarry here for hundreds of years to quarry ads for uh, basaltic tools. And they could always use that water for drinking because there's no water up there except in the winter. They don't want to be there in the winter. They want to make the ads in the summer. A few years ago, for the first time in history, of recorded history, the, the light lake dried up completely. Again, inversion is lower, higher temperatures, but there is fluctuation. Everybody said, oh my God, Lake Waiau is gone. No, it's come back. There's water in the lake right now, but the, sh the changes are shifting to more dry conditions and less wet conditions. So the frequency and level of water in the lake is likely to decrease. It may ultimately be dry permanently, but right now uh, we have had conditions of total drying of Lake Wyal. If we look at the shifts in mountain ecozones, look at the diagram on the left, okay? You see the different ecozones, rainforest, metrocitrus, that's ohia and cibodium tree ferns, montane forest with acacia koa, koa trees, higher forest, maybe dominated by uh, uh, Nio and um, Mamani, and then little shrubs up higher, uh, Ohello and uh, uh, various plants. Notice where they are today. If you wanna be in the acacia zone, you gotta be up around two th under 6,000, three, 6,000 feet, you'll be in the acacia forest. But 20,000 years ago, the acacia forest was down at about 3,000 feet these shifted with the climate change, had nothing to do with humans now. There were no humans here 20,000 years ago, okay? So many of you know Palolo Valley on Oahu at the top back of Palolo Valley, there's a crater up there, Ka'au Crater above the, above the valley. And we took a core from that crater, five meters, about 15, 20 feet thick of gunk from the bottom of that crater and looked at what was in there. We looked at pollen. And you see that pollen grain that looks like a waffle? That's, a, that's what a koa pollen looks like. It's not really round, but I just took close up. Anyway, there was 20,000 years ago, and we got radiocarbon dates for the bottom, which was 20,000 years, there was a lot of acacia pollen there, uh, about 20%. Now there's none virtually, because there are no koa trees around there anymore. The koa trees would be higher elevation. Uh, the swamp is only at about 1,000 feet. So we know these vegetation zones shifted, and with them, the, the uh, plants and animals associated with each of those zones shifted. When the climate shifted, some are winners, some plants got, did better, some did worse, some animals went extinct naturally, some did better, and some evolved into uh, being able to handle the changing environment. The Hawaiians understood this. When they settled the island about a thousand years ago, uh, they were agriculturalists, and they settled all the islands. This just shows the ahupua'a on the island of 
uh, Kauai. And you can see these are the boundaries of the land division set up by the Native Hawaiians to manage those ecosystems. But they all went to the high ground because they knew where the water came from. And you can imagine if they did it a different way, if one king said, I'm gonna take all the coastal land, then the other people would say, well, wait a minute, we wanna go fishing. No, you can't go fishing, I'm gonna do the fishing. And uh, so that wouldn't work. So they all divided the land so they had access to all the different ecological zones for harvesting koa trees for canoes, for planting various coastal crops, planting inland crops, crops, adjusting the water flow out of the awais into the irrigation areas. So they developed an ecological system for agriculture that took advantage of the ecological zones that occur here. They understood that because they were living here and nobody was bringing them food. Uh, they had to get their own food. So they had to figure it out and they did. And they got a system that minimized conflict amongst themselves. Everybody had access to the ocean. Everybody had access to the mountains. Some had bigger ones and littler ones, but that just meant there were fewer people in the smaller Ahuala. Anyway, so, and the Hawaiians appreciated the biodiversity. They could get different medicinal plants. They could plant different agricultural plants, different canoe plants at different elevation. And they exploited the resources to build a large population. There were perhaps half a million people here when Cook arrived maybe more, some suggested even as much as a million people, which is almost as many as we have here right now, living only on what they could produce locally. So they did change the environments, obviously. They cleared some forests to plant agriculture, but they protected other forests for watershed and for other medicinal plants and so on. They understood the ecozones, okay? And they had various proverbs that explained this, uh, protecting the water, so on and so forth. Now, coming back to the Big Island, I want to talk about this observatory, Mauna Loa Observatory. Uh, but before that, um, as these zones shift, these agriculture, remember I showed you the, the zones on the, on the Big Island, as these zones shifted, the plants could shift. For example, Ahinahina, our native silver sword, lives on Mauna Kea. Okay. Traditionally, or in recent times, and the climate hasn't changed that much in the last thousand years, but they lived in a certain zone, they were adapted to a certain zone. Why are they silver? Because they live at high altitude, where they get a lot of sunshine, too much sunshine. Plants need sunshine for photosynthesis. If they get too much, it burns them up. So they're silver, they reflect a lot of light, they got too much light, they got not enough water. So if we look at where the silver sword the Mauna Kea silver sword lives or survives. It's in this area of green on Mauna Kea. Not on the very summit of the mountain. It's too windy, it's too cold, it's too harsh up there. A little bit below the summit, some of the summit, cinder cones below the summit and down to seven, eight, 9,000, well, about eight, 9,000 feet. That's where they're happy, okay? Um, and so what will happen if the climate changes, as I suggested in the next 100 years, it gets several degrees warmer up there, where will the silver sword be able to live? Now, in fact, the silver sword are not living in all those areas because we put feral goats, sheep, cattle, pigs, and all kinds of stuff up there. But this is where they could live if it wasn't disturbed by human activity. This is where they would live in 100 years. They get pushed down from above because it's getting drier, and they get pushed up from below because it's getting warmer. So the potential habitat for these individual species shift with climate change. They also shift with obviously human activity. Here's another species, haha, uh, a lobeliad, lives in the wet forest. In the upper wet forest, it loves cool, foggy, misty areas at mid elevation, 5,000 feet, so on. This is where you find haha uh, today in the, in the green area. The interruptions are because lava flows go through there and they don't grow in lava flows. What happens in 100 years? According to the climate map, the, um, according to the climate map, they would only occur in that tiny little red area, okay? Okay, uh, so there's a problem of potential extinction caused by climate change. As these uh, individual species. Okay, we're running to one o'clock now, so some of you are gonna probably wanna check out. I'm gonna keep going for another three hours, no. Uh, I should be done in about 15 minutes, but uh, feel free to depart. You've got some uh, idea of what I'm talking about. Forget about the turtles and think about 
the Big Island and the Hawaiian Islands and biodiversity. Okay, individual species may move, but also entire ecosystems will move, okay? Remember this diagram, they're gonna go up and down, uh, not, and in each of those zones will be many species. Now we're looking not at individual species, but at ecosystems. The reddish brown area is lava flows where there aren't too many plants growing. But look at the deep blue. That's montane wet forest. That's where that haha -ha lives, okay? There's some in Kona, along the Kona coast or some in the Kohala mountains in Kau and on the windward side of the big island above Hilo. But that's, pre that's a present distribution of these ecosystems. And of course, many of them have been disturbed by human activity of all different kinds, but that's where they are in general, okay? What about 100 years from now? The deep green has disappeared in Kona, got smaller in Kau and above Hilo, and got smaller on uh, the Kohala Mountains. If you look at the diagram on the right, you'll see in 100 years, the area under montane wet forest decreases by more than 50% from around 800 square kilometers down to three or 400 square kilometers. They've lost territory and the species associated with them, the biodiversity will probably have decreased, okay? And that's true for subalpine, alpine. Are there any winners here? How about lowland wet forest? That gets bigger because it's warmer at higher altitudes. So the wet forest, the lowland forest can go higher. Uh, so some winners, but there's also the area and I guess it's purple, uh, new climate. We've got a new climate area where there's had never been one before. It's even warmer than anything we have right now. What's going to happen in that area? I suggest it's going to be weeds uh, because we're not going to give it enough time for evolution to figure out new species for those areas. But you get the idea. Now, 100 years from now, okay? This is climate change largely driven by human activity. Obviously, other changes will take place in these maps because of ongoing human activity. We clear areas for agriculture, we graze areas, we do all kinds of stuff, okay? Now, I'm just gonna finish up with my friend, Ray Fosberg. Ray Fosberg got his master's degree at UH Manoa in 1930. I worked with him in the 90s and 80s, uh, famous botanist. Um, he went up Mauna Kea, excuse me, he went up Mauna Loa in 1958 for one day just to went Mauna Loa Observatory and on the way down, he just recorded with an altimeter the highest elevation he found any plants below the observatory, which is at about 11,000 feet. And he wrote it down and he published in a little article. Okay, he just worked maybe an hour to catch this information. He published a little article and said, okay, I found this plant at 11,000 feet. I found this plant at 10,500 feet, the highest elevation I found these plants. We thought that was cool because he actually recorded the data and the information. He went up to the observatory, which was just being built at that time in 1958. And there weren't any plants at the observatory at that time. They just built it. And he went down the road and he stopped where he found plants. Now he only found plants on the Pohoihoi. That's a whole other matter. The Pohoihoi will support plants in the same environment that Aa -Ah won't because the Pohoihoi is smooth and the water drips into cracks and there's a little better habitat in those cracks than in the Aa -Ah where there's no places to accumulate anything. It just all drains underneath. Anyway, so when you find some Pohoihoi up high in the mountain, you often find a few plants growing on it when the Aa -Ah adjacent won't have much of anything. Anyway, uh, on Fosberg's trip down the mountain one afternoon in 1958, he recorded the highest place he found any particular plant. And then he published that. And he found little interesting things like he'd find some mosses, not everywhere, just under certain places. Now, where is this place? It's where fog and rain drip off the rock into a little crack and it makes it just a little bit moister than the other exposed areas. So the plants figure that out. So it's a really tough place to make a living up there and not many plants can do it. And he only found on this trip he took from 8,500 feet to 11,000 feet along the Mauna Loa access road, raising over 3,000 feet of elevation and where the rainfall was 35 inches a year at the bottom where he, he started and only about 20 at the top. And he stopped along the way and looked for plants. And here's what he found. Fosberg in the middle there, Fosberg 1958, not very exciting, five plants he found, okay? 
Um, let's see, the second one is, uh, uh, or Dubautia uh, vaccinium 3048, that's Ohello, okay? Um, so we found some of these plants um, um, at different elevations uh, and there were only five and that was the highest, there were, he found more than five plants, but that was the highest elevation they occurred. We did the same survey 50 years later in 2008. Look at all the plants we found 2000, uh, 2008. We just did a study a, a year ago and we found even more plants, but this is the article we published after 2008. A lot more plants. And you see the ones over on the left with the little black symbols next to them? Those are alien species, non-native species to Hawaii, okay? And uh, there were lots of them when we did our survey and there's lots more now, but there weren't any alien plants up there in 1958. And Fosberg was a good botanist. He wouldn't have missed them, okay? So, tremendous increase. He found five, we found 22 species. So we write a paper. What do we write in the paper? We say, oh, uh, your, your uh, instructor there, Mackenzie, she's been publishing all this information. The climate's warming up. This is her data from 1955 to 2016 at Mauna Loa Observatory. The temperature is rising. This is the minimum temperature rising from about uh, two degrees uh, minimum temperature on average in 1956 up to two and a half or three degrees minimum temperature. You say, well, that doesn't sound like much, but it has impact because the higher the minimum temperature, the fewer days you'll have freezing temperatures. This graph shows the change in the number of days where frost is recorded at Mauna Loa Observatory. In other words, below zero temperatures. In the 50s, 80 to 90 days a year on average froze at night. Now, it's less than 30 days a year that freeze. What does that mean? Oh, it means the plants that don't like freezing can do better up there because it's warmer. So we write a paper and say, climate's warming, temperature's rising, less freezing, more plants. Those plants are there because of global warming, bad global warming, okay? But maybe that's not really the answer because she also plotted the rainfall Remember that if it's warming up, the inversion is getting stronger. There's less rain at higher elevation, less fog. The rainfall is decreasing over that same period. Warmer temperatures might make some of the plants happier, but less rainfall is going to make them all angry. They're not going to be happy. So in fact, so in fact, um, the, uh, they may be balancing one another. Maybe global warming is helping the plants, but global, but local rainfall decrease is not helping the plants. So now we conclude that maybe these differences are caused by something else. Because look at look at uh, vaccinium. It was at three zero four eight meters in fifty eight. It's at three zero six seven meters. It's only moved up. Maybe a, another plant got a few meters higher. In other words, it's not moving. Okay. And all these aliens are showing up. So maybe something else is going on. So then we looked around Hawaii, then we looked around the observatory and we realized that the observatory, which is in theory measuring climate change was inadvertently and accidentally modifying the local microclimate right around its buildings by runoff from, this, from the uh, uh, roof of the buildings, uh, by paving areas and so on and so forth. And so I've circled where there's plants growing around these buildings, okay? Look at the one on the left where one of our other students, she's not working for Mauna, Mauna Kea, uh, she's, there's a little patch of snow there because it's on the north side of the building. So snow lasts longer there, melts slower. And so some weeds are growing there. Then we looked around more and the cracks in the pavement where runoff comes from the driveways and so on, uh, that's where the plants are growing around these buildings. And that's where all these alien species are showing up. Why are they there? Because people drive up with cars with seeds on their, on their tires or on their pant cuffs or on their shoe bottoms and so on and so forth. So in fact, the change from five to 22 
may be related to climate change, may not be specifically related to global warming because there's also rainfall decrease, but appears at least in the case of many of the aliens to be purely related to human activity around those buildings. So now we have to write the paper and say, well, me, you know, climate's changing, absolutely. And that's causing all kinds of stuff to happen. But in this particular case, we can't just jump up and say, oh, climate change. No, there are other factors, usually human induced factors that are also important. So this little plant at Mauna Loa Observatory, which we recorded and hadn't been there before, look, it's right next to the concrete, to the asphalt and concrete and water is running off and it gets a little bit more moisture than anywhere else and so the plants can grow there. So that's not climate change, that's human manipulation of the substrate, okay? Putting in a new substrate, a new surface that happens to, remember, seeds of plants and spores of ferns are falling all over the place all the time. Most of them don't grow because they fall in a bad place. The ones that fell right next to this asphalt fell in a good place or concrete. So yes, climate is changing. Human induced climate change is dramatic and it's gonna have all kinds of uh, negative effects, maybe some positive effects somewhere. Maybe they'll be able to grow uh, sugar cane in Canada, I don't know. But the point is that uh, most of the change we detect in biodiversity probably has multiple factors, not just climate change. And this makes it really complicated to manage ecosystems, to manage an endangered species, okay? Right now, oh, I came back to turtles. Oh, I must be at the end. Uh, okay, uh, we just published a book on the most endangered tortoises in the world. And that golden tortoise there is one from Madagascar that I rediscovered in the early 70s. It was presumed to be extinct. But anyway, forget about that one. I'm now working in Namibia and there's five or six, seven different tortoises there. and they're under threat from climate change, absolutely. The deserts are getting drier, but there's also other human activity, collection for the pet trade, uh, overgrazing of land, all kinds of stuff, okay? So yes, I'm working on tortoises in different parts of the world, but you might say, why don't you just stay home and work? We've got a lot of problems here. Yeah, okay, I'm doing that too, don't worry. Uh, but the tortoises, uh, we like tortoises. My students love the tortoises. and there are lots of baby tortoises, okay? But we're forgetting about the tortoises now, okay? So most of my work here in the islands over the last 50 years has dealt with native plants, climate, intersection of plants and climate, endangered plants. If uh, we published this book a few years ago, A Small Guide to the Big Islands Endangered Plants and Ecosystems. If any of you want a copy of this book, I'll donate a few to your instructor to um, Ms. McKenzie, and she can give them out to deserving uh, candidates. This is mainly about plants and endangered species on the Big Island, however. So if you're from the Big Island, you probably want one of these. Anyway, and as we say, uh, protecting of our ecosystems here in Hawaii is complicated by because we have so many people, so many different economic activities and human activities, so many traditional activities, and climate change is on top of all this. So it makes management very, very complicated, okay? But remember, the life of the land is conserved in righteousness, okay? Thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'll uh, entertain them if anybody's still here. <laughs> Thank you, Jim, that was awesome. Um, we, we have a question in the chat box I just checked in. It's from Eileen. Um, okay. Are these human-induced changes on Mauna Loa causing climate change? I'd say the human-induced changes on Mauna, on Mauna Loa, first of all, most of Mauna Loa doesn't have any human activity, except maybe feral goats or sheep wandering around somewhere. But the only place up high on Mauna Loa is basically the observatory and people that hike around because it's in the national park. So you can hike up there and hike down. But that's not causing climate change, but it may be transporting uh, alien plants or fooling around with some of the native biota, but climate change, no. It's global climate change that's affecting the climate change on Mauna Loa, not so much local climate change. Right. Dr. Juvik, you're really excited. Um, Natalie Wall, our librarian and our chair of the Sustainability Committee, said that we do have your book in our library, so that's awesome. But I okay, will take well, you <laughs> for my students. Okay, you can't sell them, you have to give them away, okay? Okay, I promise. <laughs> Yay. Any other questions? Yes, is there any other questions from the audience? I have a question. 
So I know that there's like um like all of the biomes will eventually change. Will they all eventually become deserts and savannas if global warming is to continue? Like if it keeps getting increasingly hotter and the, the climate is going to change, will majority of our biomes become deserts and savannas that can like sustain only like dry base kind of landforms or like animals? Well, um, generally there's some kind of feedback at some point. In other words, if it if it gets so hot that people are dead, then they won't be burning any more oil, okay? And things may moderate. But generally speaking, even as it gets warmer, there'll still be air rising on the windward side of the islands and cause, could cause even more rainfall in certain situations, okay? Because warm air holds more water vapor, okay? But yes, generally, uh, in the short term, if uh, it keeps getting warmer, you're gonna get more drier. It showed, for example, in that diagram, the, um, the, de the drier areas got larger as the century went by, uh, although, and the wetter areas got smaller, okay? So yeah, you would tend to get more dry conditions. And of course that ignores whatever humans are doing to the place as well, burning it, farming it, uh, irrigate. They can take water from one place and irrigate another area. So generally you would get more drier areas with increased warming, but um, not always. You could have wetter areas somewhere uh, because of uh, increased rainfall, okay? Okay, thank you. Great, thanks for the question, Tatiana. Any other questions? I must have answered everything. Right. No, I have a question in a matter. Like, I was like, a, when you were talking about CO2 emissions and yeah. how China and India are like the biggest contributors, um, with us being on lockdown and like the big, like the big countries like China and India also on lockdown. And there was like a big old decrease of CO2 emissions. Will this help in making a sort of a, like help in slowing down global warming in this like time of lockdown when people aren't really on the roads right now and like there's less CO2 emissions than there really ever has been in a few decades? Well, certainly it, uh, w there, there is a, in fact, the other day, the price of oil in the United States went to zero. In other oh, words, you could say, how could it be zero? Because the producers have so much oil, they don't have any place to store it. They were giving it away. Uh, and uh, I, I went, to my, went to my gas station, asked for free gas, but they wouldn't give it to me. Anyway, uh, so, uh, but, so the decrease in oil production and so on, and the stopping of factories using coal, just all the activities that burn fossil fuels have slowed down dramatically, but not completely. China's going back online right now, okay? In fact, most of China was not shut down during this event, that uh, Wuhan area, that province. But, um, and if you listen to our government, we want to get back to work as soon as possible, you know, uh, get everything running again, bring back the economy. So sure, there'll be a temporary glitch in, in uh, CO2 emissions, but it may come back fast and strong when people get back. I think it's going to be complicated in Hawaii because we can all say, I was just listening to somebody saying that Oh, the mayor of, uh, of um, Las Vegas was saying, we're opening up, we're ready to go, we're opening everything. And I said, yeah, but who's going to come there? You know, are you going to fly a plane there? I don't think so. Is gambling going to be the first thing you think about, uh, you know, next week after they open up the casinos? I don't think so. It's the same with Hawaii. We can open up all the hotels, but will anybody show up? Who wants to fly? I think people want to go to a restaurant if they're going to test ability to go out. They want to go to a restaurant before they're going to get on a plane and fly 5,000 miles, okay? So we could open, open up all the hotels and maybe nobody shows up for quite a while. Who knows, okay? But yes, there, there've been a, in fact, one of the things biodiversity interesting is you're showing why wild animals are showing up in cities, okay? Coyotes in LA, uh, monkeys in some place in uh, Thailand that they used to feed, the tourists used to feed them on the countryside near the city. Now they're all in the city looking for food because the tourists aren't there. So all kinds of things can change, but I think that the CO2 emissions definitely took a nosedive uh, and are still probably going down until we rehabilitate the economy and everybody gets back in their cars and, and so on and so forth. So free gas for a while, maybe, I don't know, okay? Okay, gotta go to the gas station soon then, thank you. <laughs> Yes. Okay. okay, well, I appreciated your uh, attention. Troops, yeah, that's it. Thanks. However many there were of you. <laughs> We've had about around 30. 
Oh, okay. that was great. Thanks, Jim. All right. Yeah. If you don't have any questions, I'm going to end the meeting. Um, I will upload, I will send this um, video to Natalie and she'll post it online. And so we can okay. review it and there. What are the royalties again? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Marie, for setting this up. Okay. Of course, thanks, everyone, for tuning in. <laughs> Happy okay, birthday. Mahalo, aloha. Okay. Thanks, Bye. Jim. Hi, thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful day. Cheers. Mommy.